So thank you very much. This is a, a real pleasure to me to be back here and especially since I've known Eduardo for a while and this is really a combination of a major effort as it's clear that will be very, very useful for many years to come. Just to give you one example, I teach every year a income tax treaty seminar and the, uh, what's nice about this is that I only have to teach the introductory class and after that the students present the entire seminar comparing the OECD, UN and US model, you know, article by article. Uh, and until now, there really wasn't a very good day beyond the comparison of the text to get hold of, you know, various three, uh, this cases that involve each article. And now all I tell them is, you know, you go to the Golden Bridge, you're presenting <laughs> Article 12, read all of these cases, and bingo, you have a first-rate presentation. So the, the quality has increased dramatically since this book became available, and this is a wonderful for me as a teacher to see that. Thank you, Eduardo, for doing it. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, an art, a paper <laughs> that is now finally publicly available because it is being presented at the National Tax Association a meeting in Philadelphia next month. And so you can go on the website and get it. Until now, you know, I had it, but it said not for citation or, you know, et cetera, so I couldn't really refer to it. But I think it has some very interesting data that relates to and bolsters some of the conclusions in Eduardo's magnificent work, so I thought it was good. And this is by uh, Elliot Ash, who's an economist from Warwick, and Omri Marian, who I'm proud to say is my student and is at the University of California at Irvine. Uh, so next slide. Uh, so what they do is that they take a database of all the treat tax treaties ever uh, concluded, I mean, more than 4,000 of them, because they also includes ones that have been superseded. And you can see, I mean, this is obviously not surprising, but it's nice. So, for example, you can see how many there are now, which is about 3,000, and you can see the gradual growth of treaties over here, and every year there's more treaties and more treaties and more treaties. Uh, and so they take this database of all the treaties plus the models, so the, you know, OECD, UN, and US models, there are various versions. And then they do something uh, which is called, uh, just to get the terminology right, natural language processing, which I don't understand at all because it's a computer science thing, but some of you may uh, be able to understand that. And they engage in some sophisticated mathematical analysis, which I also can't understand because I don't even know, remember what the cosine is. And the result, what they are trying to do is to determine the similarity of treaties to each other and to the various models word by word. And it was always clear to me, and it's clear to anybody who does treaties, that by and large, tax treaties are similar to each other. And a lot of the words are you know, essentially identical because they derive from the models. But what's interesting is how much, which models, and how has that changed over time. And that's what they do, and I think it's fascinating. So next slide. This is the what they call the pairwise tax similarity of active treaties by year. And this is, you know, the mean cost and similarity of active treaties. I think this dotted line is from the 25th percentile to the 75th percentile, and the, the, you know, blue line is the average. And you can see, basically, this is convergence, right? Which is also the main thing that I derived from Eduardo's book. I mean, it has this wonderful section in it that shows, basically, how various countries evolved through six stages of tax treaty disputes. And what's really amazing about this is that he can essentially predict the future to some extent, that is, a country that is in stage three is likely to evolve to stage four, five, and six, you know, as other countries have already done. So here you can see that basically in 1970, there was about 60% similarity in the words of every two treaties that were enforced back then, and by now, it's about 80%. So this is, you know, if talking about the international tax regime, I mean, that's exactly uh, what Eduardo and I are talking about. I mean, you can see, and as we'll see in a moment, this is primarily due to in the increasing influence of the OECD model. Uh, so, if it, you know, this is, this is basically for you. Uh, so, <laughs> next slide. Okay, so this is the most interesting slide, and uh, it shows the similarity to the three models. So, what you can see 
Uh, obviously, I mean, the OECD model is the oldest because it starts in 1963, and then comes the UN model in 1980, and the first US model in 1981. And so for each year, you can see the similarities of all the treaties in the database, and all the treaties that were enforced in that year, to the various models. And you know you can you can see some interesting developments, uh, and we'll come back to a moment. But for example, let's let's just look at the U.S. model, the Green Line, which is the easiest to interpret because there, of course, it's only one country that we're talking about, and the U.S. has introduced in the in recent decades, decades there has been a new U.S. model predictably every 10 years. So there was one in 96, and then one in 2006, and the last one is from 2016. Of course, every time that a new model is in introduced, you can see the line going down sharply because the old treaties do not reflect the new model. The new model has different language than uh, so. And you can see the impact of the new model that the new treaties now you know, are more similar. The new treaties will not be similar to the old treaties because the new treaties are on the new model and the old treaties are on the old model. Uh, so gradually you can see how this um, evolves. And this big jump, I think, is the OECD model from 1977, something like that. Uh, and this is the UN model, and you can see how they gradually converge with each other. Um, and what you can also see clearly is that, except for the very last few years, which I will get back to, the OECD model is dominant. That is, the OECD model is the one that most treaties resemble to. And also, you can see, which is obvious to anybody who reads them over time, their gradual convergence of the UN model towards the OECD model, which is something that Eduardo has emphasized in his work. Next slide. This is, I think, might be the most, oh, I forgot, before I get to this one, there's also a chart which I haven't reproduced here, doing the similarities article by article, and that's fascinating. I really suggest that you take a look. So, for example, by far the most similar article is Article 9, Associated Enterprise. And I've argued for a long time that the arms standard is part of customer international law, and it's binding. So here's proof, right? Mm -hmm. You know, this is the one thing that is in every treaty, and, you know, the wording is exactly the same, and so on. So uh, I think that this shows, you know, dramatically uh, how, you know, this is more binding than any other element in the treaties, as, as you know, I've thought for a long time. So here's, this is kind of the proof of the relative importance of the OECD model. So what you can see here, this is 10 years before, five years before a model is introduced, a new model is introduced. This is when the new model is introduced, and then five years later, 10 years later. Of course, now, the complexity of the OECD recently is that they've been updating the model every year, but you know, it used to be that it, you know, the word is defining days when a new model, a new OECD model was introduced. So here what you can see pretty clearly is that, of course, before the new OECD model is introduced, there is no, I mean, the line is straight because there's no increase in similarity to the new model before the model is introduced. But once the model is introduced, whoop, you go up, meaning the new treaties that were negotiated after the new model is introduced are similar to that model, which shows that, in fact, the OECD model, whenever it's changed, actually impacts actual treaties negotiated by OECD countries and, in principle, also non-OECD countries because this includes all countries. Next slide. Now in the UN, you don't see this at all. Uh, there's no slope in the line. This is when a new UN model is introduced. You know, the, you could maybe argue that the UN model is kind of a lagging indicator in the sense that you can see some a little slope in the line here in the sense that various countries introduce elements in the new model before the model is introduced. But there's basically no no indication of an impact of the model after it's introduced. The line is completely straight. And finally, the US model, here, I mean, this is, the, of course, the most dramatic jump, because the US model is only about US treaties. So when a US model is introduced, immediately, you know, the new treaties are much more, I mean, they're like 90, you know, 90 something percent similar to the new model because every US model that's, every US treaty that's negotiated after the new US model is introduced follows the new US model. But what's also interesting is that this line actually slopes, and that means, and I know this from working with US treaties, what the US tends to do is it introduces new elements in the actual treaties before they put them in the model. 
So, for example, you know, it took a very long time, but finally the U.S. accepted binding arbitration in tax treaties, and they negotiated several treaties that had binding arbitration, and then in the most recent model, they also put binding arbitration into the treaty. So the actual arbitration in the Canadian treaty or in the German treaty and so on precede the model, and you can see that in other changes, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Like now, you know, there's zero percent withholding on direct dividends in some U.S. treaties, but they haven't put that into the model uh, that they put up last year, etc. And we'll see because the new model, you know, the new model has a lot of new elements, and it's interesting. So now I just want to let's let's go back a little bit to the slide that has the three three three, sli three slides earlier. This one, yes. So now I just now I just want to speculate a little bit, and here I don't know, uh, and they don't really talk much about this in the paper. But I'm interested in this phenomenon that in really recent years, so around 2010, the impact of the OECD model goes down and the UN model actually overtakes it a little bit, uh, which is somewhat inconsistent with you know, the, the notion that the global platform, you know, that, that the OECD model is dominant. So I wonder why that is. So one explanation that actually is mentioned in the paper is that countries have been verging more towards source taxation and less towards residence taxation. Of course, the UN model is more favorable to source taxation than the OECD model, so that's that. I don't quite see that as a persuasive explanation. Uh, I think there's something else going on, and I think what's been happening is that in the last, you know, pre-BEPS, because of course this all ends uh, like, like Eduardo's book, it ends with BEPS. BEPS and the MLI, which we will hear about, is a new new world. Uh, but in the last 10 years or so before BEPS, uh, there was, I think, a tendency to make significant changes in the OECD, and by the way, also in the US model, that were not made in the UN model. So I'm thinking about the deletion of Article 14, and the introduction of new changes in Article 7 and Article 5 and the authorized OECD approach and the treatment of branches as if they were subsidiaries and the application of the arms neck model to uh, branches and the deletion of 7.4, which is the, the, the allowance of formula apportionment methods, et cetera, et cetera. So none of these changes were made in the UN model. And I think, I mean, there's on one of these, I've actually done the research. So 7-4, because I care about formula apportionment notoriously, <laughs> I looked at actual treaties, and there are way more than 100 treaties that still have 7-4 by OECD countries without OECD countries. So there's been resistance, basically. Uh, and I think that this is what explains, uh, because the, it's just that the UN model is more conservative, and countries wanted to keep that in a way. And so they didn't adopt these new changes. I don't know. I mean, Sophie may have. Uh, some interesting uh, observations about this. So finally, um, I just want to talk a little bit about the future like uh, John did. And I'm worried a little bit about the future and let me say a couple of things about that in, in terms of both Eduardo's book project and this kind of thinking. So one issue is obviously, uh, and we'll hear about this, uh, but the MLI, the multilateral instrument, has indeed been signed by a lot of countries. Unfortunately, not the U.S. from my perspective, but you know, many, many, many other countries. Uh, but it gives countries, famously and correctly, but notoriously, a lot of flexibility. So, other than the you know minimum standards, on almost everything else, you get a lot of choices to make. And I think the result will be, at least initially, that we will see this trend of convergence in the treaties stop, and there will be much more divergence, uh, at least for the next decade or so, and things, until things settle down. Um, and that worries me a little bit, because I care about the international tax regime, and I care about coherence and so on, and I worry that there will be less coherence. The other thing that worries me, uh, that was already mentioned, of course, by John, is MLI famously has arbitration, in it, and we will hear about that in a moment. And in particular, it has uh, the option of having so-called baseball arbitration, as we call it in the US, which means basically that the arbitrators get to choose between positions that are given to them by the parties, and they, don't, they just choose one or the other, and they don't have to give reasons. And what worries me about that is that you know, the next volume will be impossible because we will not have cases. 
everything will go to arbitration and the arbitrations will be you know, secret and nobody will understand anything that's going on. And at least from my perspective as a teacher, that would be a great pity. But we'll see what happens. Thank you very much.